on Overdrive today, we drive the India spec Mercedes-Benz GLB and the EQB. We also tell you what's changed in the Audi Q3. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Soini Dutt. Mercedes-Benz has just launched the GLB and EQB in India. And we take a drive in both of these SUVs to tell you just what differentiates it from the other. Of course, apart from the powertrain. The first time Mercedes-Benz India showed us the new GLB was almost three years ago in Utah. That was the time when we drove the new GLS for the first time. Now, the GLB has taken an awfully long time to come to the Indian market. But now that it's here, you can make a choice with three powertrain options. You can get a 1.3 petrol, a 2-litre diesel or, for the first time, an all-electric EQB, which we'll come to in a bit. If you are considering either of the internal combustion engines though, I think the diesel makes more sense. You see, both these engines are mated to gearboxes that aren't exactly the quickest in the business, but they're quite predictable, they do their job rather well, they get on with their daily chores quite nicely. And even out on the highway or in the twisties, they're pretty good. But at the same time, the diesel engine feels a lot sprightlier than the petrol. It also seems to spool up the turbochargers much quicker. That power feels more on tap. Of course, it's all because of the 400 Newton meters of torque that it has on offer. There is a bit of that diesel clatter. It's not as refined as the petrol, but it's just the punch that it gives you that makes it the nicer engine or the nicer car to drive. Also, with a car like this, the 400 Newton meters of torque makes a lot more sense because this is a three row after all. You heard that right, three rows of seats. An idea that was borrowed from the GLS and one that bumps up the practicality quotient that one traditionally expects from a Mercedes-Benz B-Class car. Here I am in the third row of the GLB to show you that the knee room is adequate. You sit in quite a bit of a knees up position and because the roof sort of tapers in, tall people are going to have a hard time in here. And there is no third row of AC vents anywhere. So for some, it might feel a bit claustrophobic, but I think this is a small cabin. It shouldn't be that big a problem. So the space that I showed you in the third row was with the second row set to, I'll not say my preference, but to a position where I have comfortable knee room. Also, the headroom is actually quite good, so anyone taller than my frame of 5 feet 8 shouldn't have a problem at all. I think up to 6 feet 3 should be fine in here. The headroom is actually quite good. Uh, even the windows, the glass house is nice and large. And if you want more light, you can always open up the panoramic sunroof and let more natural light fill in. So overall, I am pretty impressed out here. Uh, the only thing that I would want better in terms of the comfort or the seating comfort is the contouring of the seats. I think it could have been a little better and even the cushioning could have been a little softer. It's a bit too firm for my liking. But otherwise, nice place to be in. The second row seats are a bit of a give and take though because these seats also fold flat. But I wonder how many will actually do that. Unless, of course, you need to carry a full-size refrigerator. By the way, the boot space in a 5-seat configuration is only marginally lesser than a GLC. Some of the notable features include the two large screens, hard disk storage for navigation maps, wireless charging, plenty of USB-C ports, seat kinetics for the front seats, and even a car wash mode inspired by the GLS which automatically closes all the windows, the panoramic roof, and also switches off the wipers to prepare the car for a wash. If only this car had the front massage seats too. Well, that's wishful thinking, but the package would have been just perfect. Because you see, despite the reclining rear seats and the space that this car offers, this is still going to be more of a self-driven car. And while I already told you that it's the diesel that makes more sense, I think the variant to get is the 220D Formatic. Not only does it get you those stunning AMG wheels, but it also gives you the opportunity to traverse some rough terrain if you so wish. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Can you believe it? Mercedes-Benz has already launched its fourth electric vehicle in India, the EQB. I'll let Rohit tell you why this SUV is so desirable. It's astonishing that even with a laden ground clearance of 134 millimeters, the GLB is able to go over most of these obstacles that the regular trails or 
uh, pathways to your farmhouse or maybe even to some nice viewpoints like these, we'll throw at you. It will go over all of that. It will tackle potholes uh, quite well as well, even with that small ground clearance on paper. But you know what is more astonishing? The EQB that I'm driving right now, the electrified variant, despite having so many batteries in the floor, it actually has better ground clearance than even the GLB and 21 millimeters of that. Another reason to maybe consider the EQB or the GLB or the outgoing GLC is the height. It's marginally taller than the outgoing GLC. You also have a flat floor because the batteries are in the floor, but to accommodate that higher ground clearance, the floor is slightly taller. So what essentially happens is you sit in a bit of a knees up position. It's not very noticeable unless you get into both the cars back to back. Only then you will probably see the difference. But it's not a deal breaker. It's not something that I would complain about. Yes, it could do with slightly better under thigh support. I could imagine slightly better, thicker squabs right here. But otherwise, not too bad. What elevates the cabin experience further is the more enhanced ambient lighting package in the passenger side of the EQB's dashboard. It also complements the rose gold inlays in the dash, the AC vents and the upholstery. And that adds a breath of freshness to this familiar Mercedes-Benz design. The EQB's cabin is also more lounge-like in that sense. And you can also enjoy the audio a little bit more in here because of how silent the cabin is. Another difference between the EQB and the standard GLB is the noise insulation. So because this is a platform that is derived from an ICE platform, they have had to sort of reinforce some of the sound deadening material, some of the sound deadening zones, etc. And that has worked quite well. I mean, electrics are silent vehicles, of course, so you don't have much powertrain noises kicking in. But to make sure that the road noises, the tyre noises don't become too irritating, don't become too overbearing on maybe highway or uh, concrete roads, etc. They have had to sort of beef up that sound deadening. And I think they have done a very good job. It is actually quite a silent car. But just to put things into perspective, clearly not as silent as the EQS. The refinement of the powertrain, the way the engine noises have been curbed, it still doesn't feel as refined, as polished as the GLC. I think the GLC still has an edge there. And with the new one coming out, I think they'll even take that further. So even though it's the same kind of powertrains, it just feels a bit more refined, a bit more polished. This one leaves a bit of room for improvement. The EQB runs a dual motor setup, but most of the times it is the motor at the rear which is doing most of the driving. It's only in maybe hilly areas like these, inclines like these, or when it detects slip, when it wants better traction, better grip, etc. That is when the front motor will kick in. Now we are told that the system makes or takes 100 samples every second to ensure that there is enough power and torque all the time. So even on these inclines, it just climbs all of that with maybe just 10% throttle input. So there is never the dearth of power or torque. Of course, the ride is a bit on the firmer side. This is a 2.2 ton car that's almost 5 to 600 kilos heavier than the regular GLB. So, yes, for that weight, they have had to sort of beef up the suspension a little more, make it slightly stiffer, and that shows in the ride quality. But it's not something that is a deal breaker. It's not something that I'll complain about. And that with the better ground clearance, you don't have those butt clenching moments every now and then the way we used to have with the EQC or even when we had them a few times with the EQS. Of course, there is no adaptive damping. You cannot raise the car. So all those are features that are missing on this. But even without it, on the kind of B roads that we've been driving or are continuing to drive right now, it hasn't really left any room for complaint. The slightly firmer setup also makes the EQB feel more taut around bends. Add to it the mass centralization achieved by the batteries in the floor and you will be pleasantly surprised to know that the EQB handles far better than the GLB and makes the ICE counterpart feel nose heavy. The only thing that robs into some of that excitement of driving the EQB is the lack of precise engine braking control. As with most electric vehicles, you get 
different levels of regen which can be adjusted using the paddle shifters behind the wheel. So you get a D minus which gives you very aggressive braking force or regen bra braking force. Then you have the D which is like a balance and then there's the D plus which is almost like a coasting mode. So the D plus is what I've used on some of the more open stretches of the road where I don't really uh, want a lot of braking from the powertrain. I want it to just coast along. But in the hilly areas, the D mode is what I like more. The D minus, it's a bit too aggressive for these narrow hilly roads. But the D mode has just proved to be the more balanced one. And that is what I have resorted to. The acceleration is actually quite brisk. It is almost on par with the petrol and the diesel uh, counterparts. And because there is not too much oral drama to go with it, because there are not too many sounds to go with it, it almost feels deceptive how quick this vehicle is. So the safety features are largely similar between the GLB and the EQB. What it does get, however, is a forward-facing radar, uh, which essentially gives you automated braking if required. It also gives you lane keep assist and there's also a blind spot warning. So all these three features are exclusive to the EQB. Despite their boxy silhouettes, these two cars are high on practicality and are rather good looking too, which was not something we could say about the older B-Class. For those looking at making a green statement, the EQB also distinguishes itself with the slightly different fascia, the seamless tail light which also pushes the registration plate into the bumper, and of course, the blue accents and the exclusive rose gold color with matching inlays in the cabin. I'm told that they've already got triple digit bookings. So that clearly shows that the Indian market is responding to these two vehicles rather well. And it isn't hard to see why. These are all-rounders of sorts. The EQB also feels like the nicer car to drive. And should you decide to go electric at the moment, it's the best three-row EV you can buy. And I think if I had to pick, I would get the EQB over the GLB as long as my road trips would not extend far beyond the popular highway corridors in India, which Mercedes-Benz and other third-party players are already equipping with fast chargers. So the 400 plus kilometer range is good enough to justify my choice of choosing the EQB over the GLB. After watching this detailed review, which of the two SUVs would be your preference? While you think about that, we'll take a very quick break here on the show. But welcome back. You're watching Overdrive. Audi has decided to bring back the Q3 in India after a two-year hiatus. And it is now based on the MQB A2 architecture. Let's see what that means in terms of space and also how the SUV feels like to drive. Now the Audi Q3 has been right at the core of Audi India's SUV lineup in terms of its popularity. And this one, the second generation Q3, has been on sale globally for about four years now. Anyway, the second generation Q3 is finally here in India now. So today we're going to tell you how it's improved over the last version. Now the easiest way to recognize the second generation Q3 is from the way it looks from the front. So it's much more of an SUV kind of look now. That crossover shape from earlier is no longer there. And you notice this with the kink shape of the headlamp and the segmented LED DRLs. And then when you come to the middle, you notice that really large, big Audi grille. It's the new look, so to speak, with these slats and these chrome vertical sort of adornments. And that sense carries on with these sort of brushed aluminum finishes. They sort of brighten up the face, as you can see over here, and also the bumper which really helped to bring that SUV quotient up. The Audi Q3 in this guise is 96mm longer, 18mm wider and 5mm shorter than before. From the side, the glass house is simple but functional and that SUV character is further defined by the more prominent creases on the fenders and rear haunches. At the rear, the two-part LED tail lamps are quite attractive with their intricate detailing. Now the added length of the new Q3 has added a significant 70 litres to the boot space. It's now 530 litres and this top technology wherein you get this convenient power function. And the boot itself, it's a large square space, quite useful. The sill is quite low so you can easily lift up a suitcase. Now you notice that 
notice this shift to this more modular MQB architecture the minute you step inside the new Q3. It's a far more area, more spacious place to spend time in. And that's helped by the general layout and design. Now here's something that we really like about the way Audi has designed the center stack of the Q3. Now you know that dual screen layout that you find in larger Audis like the Q7, which we don't really like because it puts these climate controls on another screen. Thankfully here you have these Again, very crisp, very tactile, these damped AC buttons, which are very satisfying, very tactile to use. You have hard redundancies for pretty much all the functions that you would need. And again, this 10.1 inch MMI screen, we've always liked it. We've liked how intuitive and clear the menus are. So that continues as it is. Now the new Q3 has a 77 mm longer wheelbase. And that has solved what was possibly the biggest flaw in the last car. So as you can see now, the interior of the back seat is much more usable, much more comfortable for at least two adults. And yes, while the entry, the ingress egress isn't quite as good, the opening isn't too large. But once you're inside, the amount of knee, leg and of course headroom is great, much improved from earlier. But here's the kicker, here's what really takes it right to the top of its segment in terms of space here, the Q3. You get a massive 150 mm of travel for the rear seat and you can also recline it to quite a comfortable angle. You get six airbags and the usual crop of passive safety features, but lesser Skoda VW offerings as well as rivals do better on this count. As with the entire Audi range in India, the new Q3 is now a petrol-only offering being powered by the 2-litre turbo petrol, as seen in the Q2 and other Skoda VW offerings, putting out 190 PS and 320 Nm, which pairs with a 7-speed DCT. A notable differentiator though is that the Q3 comes standard with Quattro all-wheel drive, unlike many rivals. Now we've become quite familiar with this 2 litre motor and it performs in much the same way in all the other applications that we've driven it in as it does here. Now this isn't the most refined of these type of engines. So yeah, in the city, we wouldn't really recommend driving in the lowest efficiency mode. It just sort of dulls the whole experience down. The comfort mode is the one you should be in for the most amount of time. And yes, the DCT gearbox again at lower Speeds, there isn't any of that jerkiness or that you know hesitation that we've complained of in the past. All that has been dialed out, so none of that is there. Now in the city, at lower speeds, we don't really like the way the Q3 handles low speed potholes and bumps. Even now at this steady pace, you do hear those thuds in the cabin. And on a rough stretch of road, that does get irritating after a point. But having said that, once you picked up speed, once you are on the move and up and going, the ride really settles down. There's a sense of poise, there's a sense of control that you find typically in Audis and that's fully intact here too. Yes, the Q3 isn't the most engaging car to drive in this segment, but with the Quattro all-wheel drive system, you do get the sense of control, the sense of poise again, that is really quite nice, that's really quite reassuring. Prices for the new Audi Q3 start from Rs 44.89 lakh for the Premium Plus. But it's this technology trim that you really want, which happens to be at the higher reaches of the segment at over Rs 50 lakh. Yes, the Q3 could have been a couple of lakhs less expensive, considering you miss out on a diesel engine and safety equipment, even though you do get that Quattro all-wheel drive system. In any case, the new Q3 is a significant improvement over the last generation and it's an SUV that is spacious, well-made and one that feels like a luxury car should from behind the wheel. Well, do you think the Q3 makes a strong case for itself in the entry-level premium SUV space? Let us know in the comment section on our YouTube channel. Before we wrap up today's show though, Team Overdrive would like to take a moment to convey our condolence to the Kirloskar family. Vikram Kirloskar, the Vice Chairman of Toyota Kirloskar Motor, passed away earlier this week at the age of 64. He was one of India's finest industrialists who paved the way for Toyota India. 
He was much loved in the auto fraternity and our thoughts and prayers are with his family and the Toyota Kirloskar company. Well, we'll be back next week with the latest from the motoring world. Until next week then, drive and ride safe.